The density lab is an interesting lab for a few reasons. First, you apply the skills you learned in the mass determinations lab and the uses of volumetric glassware lab. In this lab, you'll have to measure the mass of an object and its volume to calculate its density. Second, you'll actually identify unknowns based on their density, which means this is our first investigative experiment. And we'll find percent errors in our measurements. And third, in the final part of this lab, you'll find densities of solutions and create a standard calibration curve to find concentrations of other unknown solutions. The density of a substance is defined as the mass of a substance divided by the volume that substance occupies. The units are usually in grams per milliliter or grams per centimeter cubed. In this lab, we'll find the densities of solids, liquids, and solutions. We'll find the densities of regularly shaped solids and irregularly shaped solid metal pellets. In the second part of the lab, we'll find the densities of pure water liquid and an unknown liquid, then identify the unknown liquid based on its density. In the final part of the lab, we'll find the density of different concentrations of sodium chloride solutions based on their mass percent concentrations and create a calibration curve. I'll show you how to plot the data in Excel and add an equation so we can find the concentrations of other solutions based on the calibration curve. Let's begin by finding the densities of solids. Our regularly shaped solid is a wooden block. I'll measure the mass on a triple beam balance. Be sure to refer to the video on mass determinations to review how to read the triple beam balance. I'll record the mass to two decimal places. For the regularly shaped wooden block, we'll measure the volume using the dimensions, length times width times height. Reading the centimeter scale on the ruler is essentially identical to reading the triple beam balance. Each centimeter is divided into tenths. I'll read each tenth, then estimate the second decimal place. Here's what the data section looks like for the wooden block. Be sure to report the correct significant figures when carrying out your calculations. The density of the wooden block is 0 0.789 grams per centimeter cubed. Now for the irregularly shaped metal pellets, measuring the mass on an analytical balance is simple. But how would we measure the volume of these metal pellets? We can start with a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. Recall from the volumetric video, we measure the volume of the 100 milliliter cylinder to every milliliter and estimate the tenth value. Measure the initial volume of water present, then add the insoluble metal pellets. We'll utilize the Archimedes principle, which states that the metal pellets will not dissolve in water and thus when placed in water, will displace a volume equal to its own volume. Notice that the water level rises because of the volume occupied by the metal pellets. Measure the final volume, which consists of the water plus the volume of the metal pellets. Simply subtract the initial volume of water, and we can obtain the volume of the metal pellets. When subtracting the volumes, be sure to follow the significant figure rules. Then use the significant figure rules to find the density of the metal pellets. The density of our metal pellets is 7.5 grams per milliliter, which is consistent with zinc, 7.14 grams per milliliter. Now let's find a percent error. 
Percent error is simply a measurement of how close we are to the accepted value. Here's the equation. Take the absolute value of the difference in your experimental value and the accepted value. Then divide by the accepted value. Multiply this ratio by 100 to get the percent error. When I follow significant figure rules, I find the difference is 0.4 grams per milliliter. There is one decimal place when I follow the significant figure rules. The purpose of the absolute value is that the positive and negative numbers don't really matter to us. All we care about is how far away the experimental value is from the accepted value. Our percent error is 6%, again, following significant figure rules. Percent errors less than 5% are generally acceptable in a chemistry lab. However, I'm not surprised by this error, seen as we use the less precise 100 milliliter cylinder to measure the volume. Now let's find the density of liquids using a more precise cylinder, and we'll find much less error. Interestingly, we'll repeat the procedure from the prior lab, the uses of volumetric glassware. By subtracting the mass of the cylinder, we can obtain the mass of the water. Simply divide by the observed volume of water to obtain the density. Let's find our percent error for pure water. I'll measure the temperature of the pure water because the density is dependent on the temperature. At 21.4 degrees Celsius, water has a density of 0 0.997-9073 grams per milliliter, according to the CRC handbook. Following significant figure rules, we see that the percent error is 0.38%. Yes, less than a 1% error. Using the more precise graduated cylinder improved our measurements. Now, let's repeat this procedure and find the density of an unknown liquid. In this example, the liquid density is 1.084 grams per milliliter, which is consistent with the density of ethylene glycol, or antifreeze, at room temperature. Our percent error is essentially 0%. Your instructor will provide densities for various liquids, or you might have to research various liquid densities. Now, let's do one example to find the densities of solutions. Again, we'll use the same procedures as finding the densities of liquids. We'll use prepared 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25% sodium chloride by mass concentrations. For this video, I'll only show the 20% density determination. We calculate a density of 1.137 grams per milliliter. 
The accepted value is 1.1478 grams per milliliter according to the CRC handbook. This is about a 3.6% error. Again, less than 5%, which is acceptable. Let's close our density lab by learning to create a calibration curve of known sodium chloride solutions. Here is sample data from one of my labs where students determined the density of 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25% sodium chloride solutions. The concentrations are in the left column and the densities are in the right column. I'll refer you to another video where I show you how to create an XY scatter plot. Briefly, the X axes should be on the left side and the Y axes should be on the right side. I'll highlight both columns and then go to the Insert tab. In the middle, you'll find the charts. I'll click the icon with the dots here for the XY scatter. There are a few options and hovering over the options will give you a preview. I'll choose the plot with the dots. You can click the plus icon on the top right corner and there are several options that appear. Adding the axis titles, the chart title, data labels, and trend line. Clicking this box will give you the best fit line of the data. I'll uncheck the box and I want to show you another way to add the trend line. I'll right click one of the data points and click Add Trend Line. You'll notice the option box appears on the right. You have the option to fit different types of lines, but linear works best for us. Toward the bottom, you'll see an option to display equation on chart. Click this box. The equation is now added to the best fit line. This is important because now we can measure the density of an unknown sodium chloride solution and calculate its concentration. For example, say we determine a density of 1.059 grams per milliliter for an unknown sodium chloride solution. We can substitute this value into the Y place and rearrange to solve for X, or the percent by mass concentration we can determine that the solution is about an 11% by mass concentration.